I'm reading verses 1 to 4 of Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on a day of your power. In holy garments, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You were a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, that psalm is one of the most frequently quoted passages in the New Testament. Let us sing uh, to God. Uh, rejoice one for one. Let us love and sing and wonder. come before our God in prayer. Let us pray. We bow before you, O our sovereign God, who art also our Father, who having loved us with an everlasting love, secured the benefits of that love to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, our great and perfect High Priest. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are worthy you are worthy because of who you are, but also because of the special work you have done that envelops us into the love of the Father. 
into the wonders of his grace. Oh, how rich is your mercy towards us, how fresh and renewed it is to us every day. And we give you thanks, O oh our God. As we come and worship you, we are conscious that you are the mighty God. You are the God who is self-sufficient. You do not need us. We are the ones who need you. And yet you have purposed to love us, to display your glory, to make known your renown through your dealings with us. And we bow before you with wonder. We thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ we have that perfect sacrifice. We bow before you as those who have been cleansed through the shedding of his blood. And that this has been accepted and acknowledged by you through his resurrection even from the dead. An ascension on high where he sits in session as you brought all things under his feet. We thank you that he who is the ruler of all things is the kindly ruler of our hearts and lives. Accept the worship that we bring. Help us, O Heavenly Father, by your Spirit to worship you with godly fear, to be full of awe before your majesty, full of gratitude and thankfulness in the wake of your goodness. Pour out your mercy upon us, forgiving us of recurrent sin and new sin. Help us by your spirit to know the way, but also to walk in the way that your word sets before us as a clear path. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, that it is your purpose to so bless your people. Look upon us, see us not only as a people, but as individuals. See us in our needs that have brought us before you, See us in our joys that have driven us to praise you. Hear our petitions. Bless your purposes afresh in our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At the moment we're working through some verses from uh, Philippians chapter 2. Tremendous verses and uh, speaking about tremendous things. The coming of the Lord Jesus, uh, the way in which he humbled himself, even to the death on the cross. And we come today to uh, the passage where it speaks about him being exalted uh, and given a name that is above every name. So we say together uh, what we have there printed in the bulletin. Philippians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> yes, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. How do we, in English, say that something is the greatest or the biggest? We've got various ways of doing it. Uh, it may be that we have to find some new word. I'm reading at the moment the history of the London City Mission, which started in 1835. That was just the time when, in London, they changed from having cabs with one horse to cabs that had three horses and that carried 20 people. And they had to think up a new word. And what did they call them? Omnibuses. Literally carrying everyone. No, they only carry 20 people, but they had to devise a, a new word for it. We're doing it all the time. Uh, Paul here 
does that for us, and John mentioned it last week, because he says not only um, did God exalt him, but he invents a new word, super exalted, or, or perhaps more literally, hyper exalted. He is saying that God did something to the Lord Jesus after he came and fulfilled his mission, he exalted him so highly and he bestowed on him, he gave him the name that is above every name. The word bestowed is the Greek word from of old and it's still the Greek word to give something or to thank someone. If you're in a Greek fish and chip shop and they hand you the parcel, you say, F karisto, to, to, to bestow something, to give it, and then to thank. Paul says that Jesus was bestowed with a name that is above every name. Now, one way in English that we can, uh, that we, in religious language, uh, show the greatest is to borrow terms that we have from the Bible. Who is Jesus? He is Lord of Lords or King of Kings. But what does it mean to say that he has been given a name that is above every name? You can read uh, Christian books and Christian commentaries and they will, some will say he was given the name of Lord or he was given the name of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ or something like that. I wonder whether it is rather speaking about the character or the, uh, the fame of the Lord Jesus. You remember in John's Gospel, the Lord Jesus himself, that when he came uh, to this earth, he went about declaring the name of God. Now, that doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus went from village to village saying God's name is God. No, he declared the character of God, who God was what he demanded of us, what he was going to do through the gift of his own son. I think that may be the, uh, the intention here of the Apostle Paul to say that the Lord Jesus, having come from glory down to earth and to the cross, now is highly exalted and his fame, his character, his work is being declared uh, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow before him and every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is saying not that Jesus got that name as a reward for what he did, <clears throat> but rather he returned to glory and in addition to all that he was before, now people could speak about the wonderful things that the Lord Jesus did in coming to this earth of ours. And that's what Paul has been speaking about. He came and he humbled himself and died even to the death of the cross. And I spoke a couple of weeks ago about that. And I reminded you that it was only slaves who were crucified in the Roman Empire. And yet the Lord Jesus came as a slave. He came as a servant. And he bore our sins in his own body uh, to the tree. So here this wonderful passage telling us how highly... The Lord Jesus, how super exalted he has been, uh, the, 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 the work that he has done that is proclaimed, and then at that name every knee uh, should bow and every tongue should confess uh, that he is Lord of all. So we say again uh, the, the two verses, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 11. And now we sing uh, in, in line with that and also in line with what John is going to be preaching on. Uh, we sing from him 140 in rejoice, immortal honours rest on Jesus' head. <clears throat>
from Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And may God bless that reading to uh, us this morning and as John brings that word to us later on. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. <clears throat> As I mentioned last week, uh, we are praying in these weeks for the situation in Nigeria. Uh, it's been coming very difficult for the Christian people in the north because of the uh, 
inroads that uh, Islam is making. And then uh, there was the case of a schoolgirl who happened to uh, use the word Jesus and that offended uh, her fellow Muslim students so much that uh, she was stoned and was killed. Uh, we want to pray for the Christian church there, for the families like that one who have lost uh, members uh, because of uh, their stand for the Lord Jesus. I also want to pray for uh, those not only of our own congregation but others in, in uh, retirement uh, villages or institutions. Uh, in Ocean Grove, the Seaviews Manor has a COVID outbreak there. Uh, Mary and I saw Margaret Hagens in Kalki uh, in Belmont during the week. Both of those places have very little uh, Christian input to them. And I found it very hard with Homestead in particular uh, to try and get access. Uh, though now on Sunday afternoon, Mary and I have been able to, uh, to go there. But I uh, want to pray for those people there who, who, who need the opportunity of spiritual input and uh, the, the message of the gospel. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, you know our needs far better than we know them ourselves, and we cannot hide anything from you. Our hearts and our lives are open uh, to your sight. Uh, minister to us, we pray, this day, uh, as you see that we need it. Uh, if we need a word of comfort, uh, grant it. Uh, if we need a word that will uh, strengthen us for uh, things that have to be done, uh, give it. If we need a word of, of rebuke uh, for things that we have done that are not in accordance with your, your word and your law, Lord, uh, may we accept it and may we know that we are to live uh, not by our own standards but by that perfect standard that you have given. Thank you too for the example of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we remember that he is the one who said that uh, he did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we are called upon uh, to follow the example of the Lord Jesus. We have to let his mind be our mind. We pray for blessing upon us as individuals and as uh, homes and families. Uh, thank you that you have put us in families. And uh, we pray that we may be uh, helped and nourished by uh, family life. Uh, join us together, we pray, in a common bond of love and commitment to the Lord Jesus. Uh, we pray for ourselves, we pray for all our family members. Uh, we long to see uh, them uh, coming to the same faith that you have brought us to. And may we join together with them in the common adoration of our God. We pray for the wider church of the Lord Jesus here in Australia and overseas. In particular, we think of the people in Nigeria. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will restrain the forces of Islam that have been attacking so many of the uh, Christian homes and Christian institutions, especially in the north of the country. Uh, we pray for the Christian people that they will maintain their commitment uh, to you and may yet the, the word of the gospel uh, touch hearts and lives. And uh, we know, Heavenly Father, in other places there are Islamic people who are, who are coming to bow before the Lord Jesus and uh, to know the one who is able to bring life and salvation. Uh, we pray for other suffering people too. We think of the people in Ukraine. Uh, we, uh, we are so moved when we see uh, pictures of the destruction that has been wrought there. We pray, Lord, that you will bring an end uh, to that warfare and uh, that the people are able to uh, carry on their lives uh, in peace. And we pray too for uh, church people there that they may uh, show such a commitment to you and such compassion to others uh, that they may attract uh, neighbours and friends uh, to not to themselves, but to uh, the Lord of life and uh, the one who is the saviour of those who call upon him. Uh, we pray too, Heavenly Father, for the ongoing work of uh, scripture distribution. Uh, we thank you for Gideon's, even in the Geelong area. 
Uh, thank you for their active work in uh, giving out uh, Bibles and uh, portions. Uh, we thank you for those that receive them in schools and uh, we pray that uh, the children who receive them may, may take them home and may they yet be a blessing uh, to their families. Uh, we thank you too for the ongoing work of Wycliffe Bible Translators. Uh, what a wonderful work they've done over so many years and we pray that that work may continue and even grow further uh, so that uh, all the nations of the earth may yet have the word of God in their own tongue. Lord, bless us now, we pray, as we uh, wait upon you. Uh, help us to concentrate on your word. Shut out from our minds uh, thoughts that will distract and take us away from yourself and your truth. And we pray for the forgiveness of all our sins in and through the Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing now a, a lovely hymn that points again to the same truths regarding uh, the risen Lord. Uh, we're going to sing Rejoice 250 before the throne of God above, singing it to the new tune by Vicki Cook. Uh, we remain seated until the final verse when we stand uh, as the offering is brought forward before the throne of God above. Father, we are gathered here this morning to listen to your word. Speak to us, we pray, and also accept of us and our gifts as we bring them. Teach us what it is to have such a view of ourselves and our material possessions that we know what it is to give freely and to give gladly to the work of the gospel. Use these gifts, we pray, that the Lord Jesus may be magnified and that others will come to know and to trust in him. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, would you open your Bibles now to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4? I'd like to read from verse 14 in, and then into chapter 5. It's on page 1189 of your Bibles. 1189. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, from verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honour for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now you can turn back the page because I want to focus today on verses 14 to 16 of chapter 4. I struggle to get a title, but I think uh, the title we have on your sheets, We Have a Great High Priest, uh, summarises it pretty well. I had initially written Mercy and Grace in Time of Need as another title, so there could be different ways that we could entitle what I want to say. Uh, I must say I've been greatly helped, and Elizabeth and I have. We've read through the whole book of Hebrews uh, over the last few months, and I've been greatly helped by this little Banner of Truth book. I'm not here to sell them, even though I've got a few spares at home. Um, uh, it's called, I Wish Some would I Someone Would Explain Hebrews to Me. What a title. I Wish Someone Would Explain Hebrews to Me by Stuart Olliott. It's an excellent little plainly written, uh, profoundly profound book on the book of Hebrews, one of the most helpful that we've ever, and, and we read it through, we would read six or eight verses, then I'd read what Oliot said, then the next six or eight verses, and we worked through it. So I commend that book to you. So it's been helpful to me as I've put a few thoughts together for today. Uh, so I encourage you to read and to study the book of Hebrews. Uh, let's today then look at these encouraging, uplifting verses, verses 14 to 16, in, uh, in this fourth chapter of Hebrews. Uh, there's some challenging words here. There are some assuring words here. Uh, in, uh, just as uh, some introductory words, I want to say that verse 14, it speaks of the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we really need what Jesus does for us as the ascended Lord, and I want to emphasise that later. We need it. Verse 15 speaks of what we call the session of Christ. Now, the theologians say, uh, uh, speak of the session of Christ. What do they mean by that? Uh, I'll refer to it again later. Um, when the elders of the church meet, we say it's a secession meeting. We meet as a session. Um, it comes from a Latin word, um, a little Latin word, sessio, which means a sitting or to sit. So when the elders meet, they, but they don't just sit, they talk, they pray and, uh, and make important decisions. But uh, to have a session means you have a sitting. You have a, there's a session of parliament. A sitting of Parliament. And so the word is used. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a descriptive of what happens when leaders meet or uh, elders meet. They sit to deliberate and discuss things and, they, and, and to make decisions. 
Now, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And that's why we, we speak of the session of Jesus, the heavenly session. And that is very important for you and for me. Jesus being seated at the right hand of God the Father, and more of that in a few minutes. Uh, and in verse 16, um, we see the provision of Jesus. He provides exactly what we need. Uh, he's able to sympathise. Uh, he's been tempted as we are, yet he is without sin. We'll deal with some of those things. And then in... Um, uh, uh, I think I may have left one out. No, uh, then uh, right at the end, the provision of our Lord Jesus. The provision of our Lord Jesus. Now, all of this is so crucial. Uh, yes, he provides mercy. He provides grace in time of need. Um, uh, be, uh, this teaching concerning the resurrection, the ascension, the session, the provision of our Lord Jesus, it's opposed by many. And sad to say, it's opposed by many within the church, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's opposed by the higher authorities in our lands. It's opposed maybe by some members of our family who laugh and who mock at the idea that someone could die and rise again and be elevated to the right hand of God the Father. Um, you don't have to go far from this region to know that there are places that deny the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if our Lord Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then there's no ascension to the right hand of the Father. And if there's no ascension to the right hand of the Father, there's no intercession for us. And our worship is empty. It's useless. And we're lost people. So uh, I want to, that to sink in today very much. There's no way to God apart from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died, who rose, who ascended, who intercedes, who will return one day on the clouds of heaven. And apart from all of that, to do with the person of our Lord Jesus, we're lost people. Now, this letter was written to a particular congregation. It's a letter to the Hebrews. And what was the problem? Well, in brief, they were being tempted by other Jewish people um, to go back to Judaism, to leave off their Christian profession. There is something that's better than Jesus. There's something far better than Christianity. And so these fellow ethnic Jews were saying to these Hebrew Christians, Judaism will give you everything that Christianity offers. Turn your back on Jesus. Come back to your heritage. So that was the temptation that was being put before the Christians to whom this letter is written. In other words, there were people who were starting to lose their grip somewhat. And um, even though they'd been brought to profess faith, to confess faith in, in the Lord Jesus, uh, they, were, they were starting to lose their grip. And um, that's why constantly in Hebrews, they're told to hold fast, to press on, uh, to contend for the faith and so on. And... Uh, uh, if you only have to go back to chapter 3, uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you have, because I'll be referring to passages here, particularly in chapters 3 and 4. If you look at chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, let me just read those. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that's fairly typical of some of the phrases that are used uh, within this, this book of Hebrews. Now, the temptations that the Hebrew Christians were facing in those days uh, are somewhat similar to ours, you know. Uh, the world is always tempting us. Um, our hearts are always tempting us. In what way? Well, tempting us to think that there could be something better than Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's lots of things in this world that would want to draw us away from him. We can live a fuller life without him. We can find ultimate satisfaction apart from him. And so we're hearing this on every side. Just turn the telly on. Read some of the magazines. Listen to what's being spoken in the main street regularly. So we, we have all of these uh, voices that we're hearing and things that we're reading again and again which would tempt us to... Leave it all behind. There's something better than the gospel. Now, we need to hear what the author of Hebrews is saying to us today. The context here tells us that Christ Jesus has ascended. 
He is now experiencing that, that rest, that promised rest that's spoken of in the fourth chapter that it belongs and is promised to all the people of God. And if we're going to find rest, and if we're going to find that ultimate rest, then we'll never get it apart from him. We must get it from our risen, our ascended, our interceding Lord Jesus. And so I believe these verses 14 to 16 are telling us that the Lord Jesus is perfectly qualified to help us, whatever our need might be. So point one, you have the summary there in front of you, the ascension of Jesus. Let's uh, focus on that for a moment. Verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. I'll pause there. Now see the contrast? Our high priest didn't simply pass through an, a, a curtain to get into the Holy of Holies. As John was preaching some weeks ago about the, the, the curtain in the temple being torn uh, uh, when Jesus was on the cross. And, but the, the curtain, it, it, uh, it was there and only once a year on the Day of Atonement would the high priest pass behind it and go to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. He couldn't go without blood, the, 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 the offering. And so, but this was symbolic. You see, what, what the high priest did in the Old Testament was a shadow. And you know that a shadow isn't a reality. You go out there and someone's walking by, you see their shadow. Do you say good day, good day to the shadow? Of course you don't. That's not the person. That's not the reality. And so you'll see in the, in the and we're focusing on the work of the high priest, in the Old Testament, the work of the high priest was a shadow it was it was not the substance in Jesus Christ we have the substance and so the verse is since then verse 14 we have we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens into the immediate presence of God by the way not just into the holy of holies as the old uh, happened in the old testament and so the writer continues, since we have such a high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, so it identifies the high priest. It says, let us hold fast our confession. In other words, the author of Hebrews is saying to you and to me today, Jesus knows how to bring us to God. He has gone to God. He has ascended. He is in the presence of God. He is there for us. He knows how to get into the presence of God the Father. He knows how to get us there. And so I ask the question, why are we here today? You might say just to say hello to everybody, to sing a few hymns, to go to church. A little bit more than that. Why are we here? We're here today surely because we want to be brought to God. We want to know God. We want to be in the presence of God. And the author of Hebrews is saying here that Jesus did not simply get us symbolically into a room that represents the presence of God. He actually went into the presence of God in his ascension. And he's there. And being there, he knows how to get us there. And that's the great assuring word here. He knows how, he's there for us. He's there for us. My friends, don't we all want to go home one day? You might say, oh, I'd like to go home. Where's your home? Surely we all long for our heavenly home. Didn't the Apostle Paul say, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. We want to be there with God. What a day that would be when we are there with him. And our Lord Jesus knows how to get us there. And that's the point. Jesus brings us to God. You might recall uh, that well, it's a well-known passage in John chapter 14. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and uh, he's explaining to them that he's getting ready to leave them. And the disciples can't fathom that out. They're, they're somewhat upset. And, and they said, uh, we don't want you to go. We don't want you to go. And Jesus said, don't be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. 
believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go again, if I go, I'll come again and, and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And what happens then? One of the disciples interrupts Jesus. I don't understand you. I don't understand what you're saying. I don't know where you're going. I don't know how you're getting there and how you'd get us there. How can we know the way? And in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Exclusively, I am the way. And I want you, to, friends, to understand what Jesus is saying here. He says, I, I am the way. I can get you to God. I can get you to God. I can bring you home. I can bring you through your pilgrim progress all the way across the river to the celestial city, uh, to my father's house, and no one else can get you there but me, says Jesus. Now, we've sung about this. Um, the last few lines of hymn 141 in Rejoice that we sang right at the start, the hymn Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder. Let me just read. We've sung them. We often sing and then the words disappear, but I want to draw your attention to them again. It's a John Newton song. When we hear of John Newton, we think Amazing Grace, but he wrote lots of songs. Oh, I've got one of his hymn books at home with hundreds of hymns written by John Newton. Now, look at that hymn 141, if you've got it there in Rejoice. And each of the last li couple of lines in, in each stanza, and it finishes with these words, He has washed us with his blood, he has brought us nigh to God. Jesus brings us to God, verse 1. Now verse 2, the last couple of lines. He has washed us with his blood, he presents our souls to God. That's verse 2. Verse 3. He who washed us with his blood soon will bring us home to God. Verse 4. He who washed us with his blood has secured our way to God. You can see why I chose that hymn to sing in the light of this theme. It's the same thought that I'm endeavouring to express and what is being expressed here. Jesus brings you and me to God and we need that so very much. And so I ask you, as I finish first the point, first point, is that your testimony? Is that your testimony today? Jesus Christ has brought me to God. Now, can you say that today? Or is there uncertainty? Jesus Christ has brought me to God. I have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, the one mediator between God and man, and he's there for me, for me. Point two in your summary. The session of Jesus. Now, I don't have to explain the session again. Uh, these verses appoint us to Jesus being seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, which we occasionally have said in church here, but you remember what it says, on the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended to heaven... And he sitteth, or I love the sitteth, yes. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's the session of Jesus, as the Apostles' Creed says it. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He sits down in session with, or at the right hand of God the Father. And that's important for us. That is totally important for us. My Christian friend today... Christ is at work for you. In fact, if you have a look at Hebrews 7 verse 25, it says he ever lives to make intercession for you. He ever lives. Not occasionally. He's at the right hand of the Father for you, dear Christian, and he ever lives to make intercession for you. In other words, Jesus is there bringing your needs, bringing all your concerns, bringing your prayers to God the Father. No intercessor, your prayers won't re go further than the, the ceiling of this building. He brings your pleadings, your, your prayers of repentance to God the Father. He is seated there in that session with God the Father. 
And if you're not in Christ today, if you're apart from Christ, if you do not know him as your Lord, your Saviour, your Captain, your King, your High Priest, where are you going to find your help? When the chips are down, when you're at the end of the road, where are you going to find your help? Well, the church, mum and dad, the minister, no, no, Christ alone, Christ alone. You'll be all alone on that day if you're not in Christ, joined to him in faith. And so he intercedes for us at God's right hand. Now there's an unforgettable scene in the, in the Bible and we all, we all would know it pretty well. It's in the book of Acts chapter 7 about the martyrdom of Stephen. Uh, there's Stephen. He's all alone. You know the story, I'm sure. And he's giving his life for the Lord Jesus. And he looks up and he sees something. He's there about to be stoned to death and he sees Jesus in his heavenly session. But it's a little strange when you read the passage. The Lord Jesus isn't seated. He's standing. He's standing at the right hand of God the Father. And remember, and that's a posture for prayer. Standing, looking up, hands uplifted even. And remember Moses standing up and interceding for the people of God as they fight their enemies. The picture is clear. And there's Stephen. Uh, he's looking up heavenward and he sees his saviour who's inter interceding for him before the throne of God. And these who thought they were doing God a favour by killing him, stoned him to death. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The Lord Jesus didn't let him down. And there's more I could say on that, but I won't. You and I need the Lord Jesus to intercede for us. He ever lives to intercede. And we sing about it as we've just sung before the throne of God above. He ever lives and pleads for me. There it is, we've sung it already. He ever lives and pleads for me. Can you, do you mean that when you sing that? And that's what the Lord Jesus is doing. This risen high priest at the right hand of the Father, he intercedes, he appears for us, and he understands us. You see, I'm working through the headings that you have there. I hope they're helpful. He understands us. Now, at the end of verse 15, we read that, that Jesus is without sin. Right? He, he can sympathize. He's every, in every respect tempted as we are, yet without sin. He's without sin. And then in verse 15 we read, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. And try to put this together. Try to put it together. In verse 14 we read that Jesus is God. Jesus is ascended. Jesus the Son of God, verse 14. In verse 15, we read at the end that he is without sin. And at the same time, we're told that he understands me. He understands you. How can that be? God in the flesh, completely without sin, understands my weakness. He understands my temptation. Now try to take this in. Your God knows what it's like to live here. To live down here. He has experienced your weakness. Because he took on your nature. He took on our nature. He became man. And it's amazing that this can be said. But it's an incredible help to me. The one to whom I cry out in prayer. The one to whom you cry out in prayer. In your time of need. He understands you. He understands you. He understands your weaknesses. He sympathises. We do not have a high priest, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathise with our weaknesses. 
but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. The writer to the Hebrews is saying that the sinless Son of God understands what it's like to live where you and I live. And I want you to note this too. He takes on our weaknesses. Now, Neil read from Isaiah chapter 53. And it says, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And Jesus repeats that in Matthew 8, verse 17. Jesus Christ came into this world to take on our weaknesses. Yes, he came to bear our sins, but he came to take on our weaknesses. Do you understand that? He's experienced temptation. Temptations that you and I could never understand. Greater temptations than you and I have ever experienced. Because you and I can never say, Jesus, you don't know what it's like to be me. I mean, you're God, you're without sin, you don't know what it's like. Because I think Jesus could respond and say, actually, you don't know what it's like to be me either. Jesus has experienced things that no person in this world knows what it's like to experience. And this has given him tremendous sympathy for his people. Satan is an enemy and he uses every hook and every device to cart us off in the wrong direction. And the Lord Jesus knows that and he understands that. Now why do I say that? He was tempted to sin by Satan face to face. In the wilderness, you read it in the Gospels. Jesus knows what it's like to have the, the strongest of temptations. And he sympathises with us. And he says, you come to me and I, because I understand you. I understand I'm able to sympathise with you. He knows those inward battles of the will that you and I experience. No one else may know. Maybe uh, battles in our wills that we just can't share with anyone else. And we've got it all stored up in here. And we've just got to go to our high priest. We must go to our high priest. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22. Father, he's facing the cross. He says, Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me, the cup of suffering, the cup of death. If you're willing, Father, let it pass from me. There's a battle going on in the very heart and soul of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Can you fathom that? He came to do the will of the Father and here is a battle of the wills. The Lord Jesus is saying, Father, if it's possible, take this from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He knows what it is to have a, a battle within himself. A battle of the will. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. My well, friend, when there's a battle of the will inside you, you know what you should be doing, but you don't want to do it, or you do something you shouldn't do, whatever it might be, and there's a struggle going on, you lose sleep, whatever it might be. When, whenever there's a battle of the will, he knows, he understands, he understands the pressure, he understands the pain. We have a sympathetic high priest. That's what this verse is saying. And so I say, come to this saviour, come to this high priest, come to the Lord Jesus. He calls you to come. He's near at all times. He's in all places. You can come to him while you sit in the pew in this church. You can come to him while you walk to your car, while you drive home, when you're sitting down in your lounge room at home. You can come to him. Come all that labour and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Come when you're under a sense of sin and, and you've reached the point of desperation. Come to him. 
come to your great high priest, he's offered the only guilt-removing sacrifice. And he's there at the door. And he waits to be gracious. In all our pain, all our depression, all our trembling, all our inability to cope, he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's touched with it. Yet he doesn't fall into the sin that accompanies those infirmities, those weaknesses. Hold on to this truth today because it may greatly comfort you one day. Jesus sympathises with our weaknesses. Our weaknesses grip the heart of our great high priest who is crowned with glory and honour. As a mother would feel for the weakness of her little baby, so Jesus feels with the poorest, the saddest, the weakest, the most struggling of his people. And so the author of Hebrews, I believe, is saying here, the one who is interceding for you, he understands you through and through. Nothing is hidden from him, from the one with whom we have to do. He knows what it's like to live inside your weakness. He knows what it's like to inhabit our frail flesh. He knows what it's like to be tempted. And, he's, and, and God's word here is saying, we, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Do you pray to him earnestly, believingly? My Christian friends, he knows what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to be you. He loves you, dear Christian, with an everlasting love. And we need to know that. And the author of Hebrews is saying that nobody but the sinless Son of God can give us that. I have a final point. The provision of Jesus. It's on your sheets. Verse 16. Let us then draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus knows how to give us what we most need and he gives it when we need it. In the time of need. There's a verse in your bulletin and um, I just want to read it's, it's written by Martin Luther and I actually got out of the book Christian Hymns it's underneath the summary of your sermon uh, this is verse 4 of that particular hymn, we'll say it's based on Psalm 130 uh, I'll read the last, uh, I'll read the verse. Though great our sins and sore our woes, his grace much more aboundeth. His helping love, no, oh, I love that phrase, his helping love. His helping love no limit knows. Our utmost need it soundeth. Our kind and faithful shepherd he, who shall at last set Israel free from all their sin and sorrow. That's exactly what I need. It's exactly what you need. And the author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus will provide that. He'll provide you act exactly what you need and he'll do it in your time of need. Jesus Christ is always on time. He'll do it in the time of need. Someone said, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. And I think that's good theology, good reformed theology. And sometimes we might think that he's left us hanging by our very last thread. And then he shows up just at the right time. The author of Hebrews is saying Jesus knows how to do that. He's ready to give you grace and mercy and to give you help and to free you from all your sin and sorrow, as Luther writes in that verse, in your time of need. And I'm sure some of us can testify of that. 
And this was all designed to lead us to two final things. And these three verses inside them are the two things that we must be our response. What's our response to all this? Verse 14, let's hold fast our confession. See it there? Verse 14. Since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let's hold fast our confession. Well, it so happened I brought here the confession of faith. And a lot of us hold fast our confession. You know, we hold fast the confession of faith. But that's not what it's talking about. It's, it's saying, let's not stop believing. Let's hold fast to the truth. There's an enormous pressure today for, for Christian people to give up and to stop trusting. Whether it's government legislation, teach, false teaching from a pulpit, or whatever it might be, pressure from the family. You, we don't know. Uh, this world is not helping us to continue to believe. There are so many challenges. So we're to hold fast. There's persecution in our world. We're being attacked from all sides. And the first thing that must occupy my mind when I wake up in the morning or throughout the night is this. I believe. That's the first thing. It's not what am I having for breakfast? Does my wife put the muesli on the table? No. I believe. Please God, give me grace to hold fast the confession of my faith. Lord God, I want to cross the finishing line. I want to run with patience the race set before me. I don't want to stumble. I want to, I want to, I want to finish the race. So we must know what we believe. Do you know exactly what you believe? If you're asked today, what is it that you as a Christian believe? Give me four or five fundamental points. And is this what your church believes? And then having known what you believe, do you contend for it? And we're living in an age where we must be contending for the truth and holding fast our confession. And so we stand in need of a great high priest who intercedes for us. And his name is Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God. Have you received mercy from his hand? Have you received grace from his hand? If you don't belong to him, this is your time of need. So pray to him. Pray to him. Lord God, pardon my sins. Open my heart to understand the gospel and to receive Jesus Christ into my life. Call on him. He'll answer you. He'll pardon you. You can depend on him. And so I'll finish with this. Yes, let's hold fast our confession. That's a response. But then depend on him. Verse 16. Let's with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. There's no throne like the throne of grace. There is no king like King Jesus. And his word can be trusted. In him is amazing grace to save a wretch like me. So he's saying, pray, depend on me. Believe that your prayers are heard because you have a great high priest who intercedes for you. He's there for you. And the author of Hebrews is saying, this high priest, he understands and he sympathizes. He knows exactly what you need. He knows how to give it and he knows when to give it. So pray, pray. Come with confidence to your high priest. Mercy and grace are to be found there. May we grasp onto this today and grasp on what these verses are telling us. May we recognise our need, avail ourselves of the grace and mercy that are offered by our great high priest, our exalted king and our saviour. May God be pleased to bless his word. We're going to sing. We'll sing and then pray as we go. 249, uh, so suitable for this theme. Where high the heavenly temple stands, the house of God not made with hands, a great high priest our nature wears, the guardian of mankind appears. Him 249.
God and Father, we thank you for this word that you've given to us, this word of assurance, this word of great hope and comfort. We pray that we will always avail ourselves, day by day, moment by moment, of our great high priest seated at your right hand, who makes intercession for us. Forgive us when we do not pray as we ought. O oh God, hear our prayers in heaven, your dwelling place. And as you hear, forgive us and bless us. And we thank you for our mediator. We thank you that he ever lives to intercede for us. Now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one of you now and forever. Amen.